You're watching Tag TV. Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about the breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Indian Army dismantles terror launch pads in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Hafiz Saeed operating Jamaat ad Dawa from Lahore Jail. ISIS plan to target Indian High Commission in Easter Sunday bombings reveals PSC. And multiple bomb blast rock Afghanistan doesn't skill. Pakistan Army's endeavor to push maximum terrorists into Indian territories caused it heavy damage this week when Indian Army destroyed its launch pads located in POK's Neelam Valley in a targeted counter-terrorism operation. The Army launched a major strike against terrorist training camps in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, killing around 10 terrorists besides decimating at least three launch pads. Also, continuing with its mission of eradicating terrorism from Kashmir, the Indian Security Forces wiped out Ansar Gazwatul Hind outfit which is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, a report. In a massive strike against Pakistan, the Indian Army carried out a large and effective anti-terror operation targeting seven terror camps in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir this week. As per inputs, over 50 terrorists have been killed in the military strike, leaving Pakistan in disarray. The strike was reportedly carried out after seven Pakistani SSG commandos were trying to infiltrate across the LOC to carry out a border action team strike, but were neutralized. Now, before they could attempt the infiltration, it was decided that we target the terrorist camps across. And therefore, the camps were targeted. We had definitive information. We had the coordinates of where these camps have emerged. And in the retaliatory action that our forces have taken. We have caused severe damage to terrorist infrastructure across. And let me tell you that uh, the terrorist camps opposite uh, Tandhar and Kerala sectors have been destroyed. If you recall, there were two Indian Army soldiers and a civilian also who were killed, and there were about eight of them, I think, who were injured, both soldiers and civilians. And there was a uh, substantial amount of damage done to villages in Kupwara, Naugao, uh, Tangdhar area. And this is actually, in, what you're talking about is actually in retaliation that these attacks have been carried out by the Indian Army on Pakistani launch pads, known launch pads. What needs to be realized is uh, uh, that we have the locations of these launch pads available to us. It appears from the way the statement is coming in that the attacks were not physical attacks, but the attacks were directed by artillery. The worst way that you can do it with the artillery for the enemy is that you bring your guns up and do some direct shooting. But I'm sure the launch pads will not be located in uh, so that uh, uh, to allow you to do any direct shooting. So obviously this is uh, like normal use of artillery, perhaps a more concentrated use of artillery, which has been undertaken by the Indian Armed Forces. India's offensive against Pakistani troops was launched to warn Pakistan from initiating any infiltration bid from across the border. The terror launch pads operating in regions of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir are carrying out extensive training on cross-border infiltration and fidain or suicide attacks. Five to seven terrorists are accommodated by the Pakistan army in one launch pad before trying to push them into the Indian territories. The target is to launch Pulwama-like deadly attacks in India for which Pakistan, including its Prime Minister Imran Khan, have been issuing threats from long. अभी भी जो लॉन्चिंग पैड बिल्कुल लाइन ऑफ कंट्रोल के पास सेक्टर हैं आर्मी और उनकी आईएसआई पूरी तरह इन्वॉल्व्ड है कि ज्यादा से ज्यादा मिलिटेंट रैंक्स को इस तरफ पोशन किया जाए पाकिस्तान की तरफ से तो खुली धमकियां हैं इंक्लूडिंग देयर प्राइम मिनिस्टर कि पुलवामा जैसे वाकये कभी भी यहां पर पेश आ सकते हैं और वो इसीलिए कहते हैं क्योंकि उनको पता है उनके मिलिटेंट जहां पर ऑपरेट कर रहे हैं लश्कर-ए-तौबा और जैश-ए-मोहम्मद उनकी तरफ से ऑपरेट कर रही है 
ایسی اگر دھمکیاں دیتے ہیں تو ہماری کوشش ہے کہ ہم اس طرح کا واقعہ نہ ہونے دیں ہم لوگ سترک ہیں ہماری فورسز جو گراؤنڈ پہ ڈپلائڈ ہیں وہ سترک ہیں اور مجھے امید ہے کہ وی وڈ بی ایبل ٹو ٹیک کیئر آف اینی سچ تھریٹس پاکستان ول ناٹ اسٹاپ دیز ایکشن انڈر اینی سرکمسٹانسز ٹل سچ ٹائم وی پنش ہم اینڈ پنش ہم ایکسٹریملی ہارڈ بیکاز اف دے اسٹاپ پشنگ ان انفلٹریٹرز دے کشمیر نیریٹو از لاسٹ آفٹر آرٹیکل تھری سیونٹی از بین اپروگیٹیڈ تھرٹی فائیو ایز بین ٹیکن ٹیکن آف دے ہیو اونلی اباؤٹ ٹو ہنڈریڈ ٹو تھری ہنڈریڈ ملیٹنٹس ان دا ویلی ہو ہیو آر رننگ شارٹ آف ایمونیشن دے رننگ شارٹ آف ویپنس اینڈ پاکستان از ان اے ڈسپریٹ سچویشن ٹرائنگ ٹو بیف دیم اپ ادر وائز ونس دا ونٹر سیٹ ان ایون دوز پیپل ول بی ایلیمنیٹیڈ اینڈ نائنٹی نائن پرسینٹ وی ول بی ایبل ٹو اسٹیبلش فل پیس اینڈ ٹرینکولیٹی وچ پاکستان ڈز ناٹ وانٹ ٹو ہیپن ہینس وی گوٹ ٹو ڈیفیٹ پاکستانی ڈیزائنس Indian security forces are committed to complete eradication of terrorism from the valley. After launching counter-terrorism operation in terror launch pads of POK, what followed was a complete wipeout of Al-Qaeda's offshoot in Kashmir, Ansar Ghazwatul Hind, with the killing of the group's chief, Hamid Lone, and two other terrorists. Lone, alias Hamid Lehari, was the successor of Zakir Musa, the founder of the AGH in Kashmir, who had vowed allegiance to the Al-Qaeda and was killed in an encounter in May this year. Besides Sloan, others killed in the counter-terrorism operation are Naveed Ahmed Taq and Junaid Rashid Bhatt. There are three of the 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 three. You will remember when Jakar Musa was killed. اس کے بعد اس گروپ کی کمانڈ جو ہے وہ حمید للہاری کو دی گئی تھی حمید للہاری تب سے لے کر کے اس گروپ کو چلا رہا تھا اور اور کافی لوگوں کو اس نے موٹیویٹ کیا وی آر لکنگ ایٹ دی القاعدہ ان کشمیر دس پرسن واز اے پارٹ آف دیٹ اینڈ دیر ہیز بین اے ڈفرینس ان ایڈیالوجیکل کنٹینٹ بٹوین دی القاعدہ اینڈ دی ادر ٹیررس گروپس آپریٹنگ ہیئر بٹ اٹ از امپورٹنٹ فار انڈیا ٹو سی دیٹ آل دیز گروپس آر ایلیمنیٹڈ and uh, this marks a very very important battle a uh, very important step in this battle against terrorism in a press conference held in kashmir the director general of jammu and kashmir police dilbag singh informed that the killed terrorists were part of the zakir musa group and were wanted by police for their complicity in a series of terror crimes including attacks on security establishments and civilian atrocities According to Singh, the Pakistan-based Jaisham Muhammad was also trying to coordinate with other terror groups, including the Ansar Ghazwatul Hind in Kashmir, to carry out attacks. Tino ke tino, Jaish ke saath aaj kal coordination mein kam kar rahe the, kyunki Jaisham Muhammad dheere-dheere Lashkar ke saath, Hizbush ke saath, is sab ke saath apna rabta jod rahi hai, aur unki je koshish hai ki jitni afra tafri. جتنی قتل و غارت جتنی وائلنس جہاں پر بڑھائی جا سکے پاکستان کی ایجنسیوں کے اشارے پر اس کو بڑھاوا دیں جیش محمد اور لشکر توبہ کو ہی پاکستان سے ہدایتیں آتی ہیں کہ کس طرح کی وائلنس کرنی ہے کس کو ٹارگٹ کرنا ہے اور کیا لیول وائلنس کا رکھنا ہے اس کے چلتے جیش اور لشکر یہ سارے گروپس کے ساتھ تال میل بٹھانے کا کام کرتی ہیں انڈیا ہیز لانگ اکیوز پاکستان آف ٹریننگ آرمنگ اینڈ سینڈنگ ملیٹنٹس ٹو جموں اینڈ کشمیر But tensions between the countries have flared since 5th of August when New Delhi revoked Jammu and Kashmir's temporary special status and Pakistan from that very day has resorted to intermittent ceasefire violations to infiltrate terrorists into Indian territories. Terrorist Hafiz Saeed has been operating in Pakistan despite being designated as a global terrorist and the country is facing the heat of the global community and FATF. The UN-designated terrorist and Mumbai attack mastermind has been reportedly running the affairs of his band Jamaat Dawa group from Lahore's Kot Lapad jail. The government of Pakistan appears to be the most helpless in the country as it has got least or no say when it comes to controlling the activities of its deep state that include the Pakistan army and the ISI who nurture terrorists like Hafiz Saeed in the country. Here's the detailed report. The Jamaat Dawa and Lashka chief Hafiz Muhammad Saeed has all the been put behind bars in Lahore. But as expected, he still continues to exercise the same rights as any free individual. 
In a recent expose to Pakistan's hogwash of arresting Saeed, it has been reported that lashkar e taiba creator Hafiz Saeed proceeds to conduct the affairs of prohibited Jamatu Dawa despite being detained on terror funding fees earlier this season. He is also exercising real substantial influence in Pakistan's political and legal circles. Hafiz Saeed is basically the child of uh, Pakistan Army and ISI. He is the front man for them for training these militants and this his entire organization is used by the ISI and the Army and the Pakistan government to further its interests in various countries to ensure that uh, whatever Pakistan wants to do underhand and also in Kashmir that all these militants and all who are going there are basically belonging to his organization. Now, since he is the child of Pakistan Army and ISI, this man is only shown to be arrested and after that, even when he is in jail, he, uh, he gets all the privileges as a free man. Why? Because, as you know, in Pakistan, it is basically the writ of the ISI and the army that runs and not the writ of any other organization, be it the courts or the government, civilian government. Hafiz Saeed has previously been arrested and released on several occasions by the Pakistan government under India's pressure. In December 2001, Saeed was arrested due to the Indian government's assertions that he was involved in the 13 December 2001 attack on the Lok Sabha. Later, Hafiz Saeed was put in custody again in May 2002 and in the same year, October, he was placed under house arrest. After the 11 July 2006 Mumbai train bombings, the provincial government of Pakistan's Punjab province arrested him on 9 August 2006, but he was released on 28 August 2006 after a Lahore High Court order. He was arrested again on the same day, was finally released after the Lahore High Court order on 17 October 2006. Following the 26-11 Mumbai attacks, Hafiz Muhammad Said was again placed under house arrest on 11 December 2008 when the United Nations declared Jamaat Dawa to be an LET front, but in June 2009, the Lahore High Court deemed the containment to be unconstitutional and ordered Hafiz Muhammad Said to be released. In September 2009, Hafiz Muhammad Said was again placed under house arrest by the Pakistani authorities. On 12 October 2009, the Lahore High Court quashed all cases against Hafiz Muhammad Said and set him free. As a part of Pakistan's hoodwinking policy, Hafiz Said was once again arrested on July 17, 2019. Since they are on a prescribed list, Pakistan, which had, had been receiving funds from America, tries to now put in a drama, a charade, and show to those people that, look, we are taking action against this fellow and the uh, courts are sentencing him. It is a different matter altogether that Pakistan government, the ISI and all, they produce no evidence in front of the courts. And so what happens is that as soon as he is arrested, the courts have no other option but to bail him. Even in the 26-11 case of the Bombay blast, though India has given such vast dossiers and detailed dossiers on Hafiz Said's involvement, none of this evidence has been put in front of the judge of the who is handling the case. And therefore, there was no other alternative for the judge but to give him bail. A major reason behind Said's trail of arrests and releases is the number of kangaroo courts being run in Pakistan, which function at the commands of Lashkar chief Hafiz Said. Hafiz Said has been using several trusts to collect funds for lashkar e taiba and running the state machineries on his commands. Pakistan government's claims of having shut the trust seem to be total sham because even after the so-called crackdown on these trusts, they continue to operate with the direct help and support of the Pakistan's armed forces. These uh, individuals who are there, these organizations that are there, Pakistan really cannot do anything with them because they don't want to do anything with them. Because they know that if they try to stop Hafiz Saeed from functioning, and his entire militants who are there under his command and who are armed with weaponry, they might turn against the Pakistan government itself. 
and that is the real fear amongst the Pakistan government and the army and ISI that the war between the militants and the Pakistan army would spill over in Islamabad or in Lahore or Karachi. Therefore, Pakistan government, army and the ISI, they just do not want to check these people and allow them to roam freely with their weaponry and do and also collect money for their militancy operations. Recently, after Pakistan made a plea on Saeed's behalf, the UN Security Council allowed Jamaat Dawa chief access to his bank account, which had been frozen because of the world body's sanctions. This certainly brings to light the double standard Pakistan has been pursuing to safeguard terrorists under the grab of fake crackdown on terror outfits. Five months after a deadly Easter Sunday bomb blast, the Select Committee of Sri Lankan Parliament released a report presenting a shocking revelation that not only churches but Indian High Commission in Sri Lanka was also at the target of the ISIS terrorists. The group which claimed the responsibility of the attack had Indian entities on its target with an aim to inflict maximum damage to the Indians residing in Sri Lanka. Earlier, investigation reports on the attack had established Pakistan's connection in the bombings and that clearly explains terrorists targeting Indian establishments in Sri Lanka, a report. The Select Committee of Sri Lankan Parliament on Sunday Easter attack has said that the Indian High Commission in Sri Lanka was a potential target of terror attack and also referred to intelligence input about a hotel where Indians were staying in large numbers as a likely target. The 272-page report was submitted to Parliament this week by the nine-member Parliamentary Select Committee which read the PSC notes that intelligence information received indicated that the Indian High Commission was one of the potential targets and that it is surprising an intelligence official who is a prominent part within the intelligence apparatus in Sri Lanka was not aware of the possible links between the intelligence information received and source potential targets. It is very possible that uh, this would happen because when the Easter Sunday blast happened, under the aegis of the IS, ISI of Pakistan, uh, naturally they have targeted the Indian committee also, keeping in mind that India and Pakistan are age-old enemies, 70 years to be precise. So definitely as they targeted the churches in Sri Lanka, they have also kept in mind that the Indians, Indian community living in Sri Lanka will also be a soft target and should be picked especially uh, for creating international panic, which is very true. The report clearly mentions about loopholes in coordination among Sri Lankan intelligence administration that kept an Indian intelligence official in dark about the prospective attack. Investigators identified Zahran Hashim, one-time leader of the National Tawhid Jamaat, as the main suspect behind the execution of these coordinated attacks. It's a very detailed uh, report which, which goes which goes into a lot of uh, the intricacies, intricacies of uh, uh, what has happened and why the blast happened. Now, not only the churches were targeted, uh, there is also the issue of the Indian community there being uh, targeted. And there are other uh, impl implications to this. Uh, Sri Lanka is a country which is known, is a Buddhist country, known for its uh, tolerance to religion for a long time. Uh, but uh, in the last 20-30 uh, years of the civil war, the civil unrest between the Tamil Tigers, the Tamil community and the Sinhala community, uh, the, the, uh, the, the stage has been set for the ISI, for the Pakistani agencies to create ill will among the Muslims of Sri Lanka by targeting uh, churches. So it is a calculated move by the ISI, ISI to target religion and the ethnicity of the Sri Lankans in large, the Tamils, the Buddhists and the resident Indian community in Sri Lanka. The report further points out that the Director of State Intelligence Service had sent a top secret letter to Inspector General of Police 12 days before the attack. The letter mentioned that NTJ and his associates were planning to carry out a suicide attack in Sri Lanka and that they were to target some churches and Indian High Commission. 
The letter also stated that the modes of attack may include suicide attack, weapon attack, knife attack or drug attack. They want to show, they want to internalize, internationalize the Kashmir solution. Internationalize the Kashmir solution, which uh, they can only do by taking it outside the borders of India and Pakistan. So wherever the Indians are living in large quantities, uh, Southeast Asia or uh, Europe, or America, or, or, or wherever. Wherever the Indians live in large quantities, they would like to create disturbance and a lot of things. And one more thing we would like to add, it is, it is not just Pakistan that is behind all these blasts. China seems to be the mastermind. While concrete evidence has not risen, it is very obvious that China would also like to uh, create more animosity between India and Pakistan. The report concluded that there was intelligence failure on the part of Director SIS. The PSC also speaks about failure on the part of the SIS to act on the subsequent intelligence information received after the explosion on April 16, 2019 in Kuri. On April 21st, Easter Sunday, suicide terrorist bombings in three churches and three hotels in Sri Lanka killed around 270 people and wounded more than 400 people. The eight suicide bombers were also killed. At least 40 foreign nationals and at least 45 children were reported to be among the dead. While the elites are trying to bring peace into Afghanistan, the extremist Taliban group seems nowhere close to letting peace prevail in the country. Ahead of a high-ranking US delegation visit in Afghanistan, the terrorists blew multiple bombs in a mosque of Nangarhar district during Friday press, claiming over 60 lives. Dozens of people were killed in an explosion during Friday prayers in a mosque in Nangarhar district of Afghanistan. The blast came just a day after the UN said the number of civilian deaths in the country had reached unprecedented levels over the summer as the attack underscored the record high number of civilians dying in the country's 18-year war. The attack hit mosque sets in the district of Haska Mina, about 50 kilometers from the provincial capital Jalalabad. According to the UN, anti-government forces have been responsible for the majority of civilian deaths since the start of 2019. July to September is reportedly the deadliest quarter so far this year. UN's documentation on Afghanistan reports 1,174 civilian deaths in the three months to the end of September. This is the highest number of civilian casualties that it has recorded in a single quarter since it began gathering the data in 2009. Afghanistan's National Security Advisor, Hamdullah Mohib, had recently called on the Taliban to engage in peace talks or face defeat at the hands of the government. He made the commands at the United Nations General Assembly just days after the heavily secure Afghan presidential elections in which at least 2.2 million people voted. To the Taliban and their foreign sponsors, hear this now. A message from the Afghan people. Join us in peace or we will continue to fight. As my colleague Ambassador Adil Raz said last week here at the United Nations, this is a fight we can, can win. Efforts to restart talks to end Afghanistan's 18-year war increased this month when U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Defense Secretary Mark Esper visited the country recently. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper said on his visit that the U.S. remains fully committed to helping Afghanistan for peace and will also continue to conduct counter-terrorism operations to oust extremist forces. President Donald Trump had last month declared the talks dead, blaming a surge in violence by Taliban that included the killing of a U.S. soldier. Regardless of the outcome of the election, our security partnership with Afghanistan will remain strong. Our mission in Afghanistan has not changed. We continue to conduct counterterrorism operations while supporting the development of the ANDSF. The United States remains fully committed to helping Afghans create a peaceful, stable and prosperous Afghanistan 
and to supporting the Afghans' efforts led by the government towards peace. A negotiated political settlement among Afghans is the best path to achieving this outcome. Until that is accomplished, we will continue to pursue an aggressive military campaign against the Taliban and terrorist groups that continue to conduct violence against the people of Afghanistan. Violence in Afghanistan is an outcome of Pakistan's veiled support to extremist Taliban. Its deep state, that is the ISI and the Pakistan Army, have been providing regular material and monetary support to Taliban leaders who utilize the resources to carry out unprecedented attacks in Afghanistan. Afghan civilians are dying in record numbers in the country's increasingly brutal war. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. watching Tag TV.